Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Pathways to Excellence. I have here a dashing gentleman in a dashing suit right here, the one and only YB Dato Larry Sung. YB, thank you so much uh, for appearing on this podcast. Thank you, Victor. Absolutely. Again. Again. <laughs> <laughs> you would never let me live this down. <laughs> well, it's actually my second time interviewing Larry right here, who has very kindly uh, agreed to appear on uh, this podcast right here. And we are here... Again, in the Manara PGRM. I didn't actually know what PGRM was uh, before, Larry. Yeah. Yeah. Until I realized, oh, it's a Manara Party Gerakan right at Malaysia. That's right. Amazing. It's not my party, but... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in this case right here, uh, we have a wonderful and unique synthesis of some of the themes that are covered on this channel. Pathways is a podcast about education, and also recently I've been interviewing some people who have been involved in politics along the way as well, and we are honoured here to have uh, Larry, who is not only a member of parliament representing the Julao constituency, but also a distinguished academic. You did your bachelor's I degree. Say, I won't say distinguished academic. Yeah. <laughs> Would you not? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. No? No, no. I mean, like, you went to the London School of Economics yes, for I your did, bachelor's, yeah. and right. uh, you went to Columbia Business School. Does that not make you a distinguished academic? No. <laughs> <laughs> no I wouldn't put myself in that pedestal now. <laughs> but thank you, and, and anyways. <laughs> Well, nonetheless, Larry, yeah. I would say that you are one of what we call the educated politicians of Malaysia. Not to say that other politicians in Malaysia are uneducated, but you do have a distinguished educational background, so props to you for that. If I could ask, what led you here? You had a great education at some of the world's mm -hmm. best universities before you eventually joined parliament, so what led us uh, to this point in time? Partly is because my family is uh, in politics. Uh, I've been a I'm a third generation politician. Mm -hmm. I mean to say that uh, uh, from the time of my grandfather during the uh, post independence, uh, when the first parliament was formed, uh, he was a member of parliament. Followed my dad many many years later and followed myself. So yes, we are a political family. At school, I was always given the impression that I would be groomed to to mm -hmm. enter politics. Uh, but having said that, I wasn't expecting myself to go into politics at the age of 21, you know? mm -hmm. which was a very interesting period in my life because I was just finishing off my undergraduate mm -hmm. uh, program and uh, given the opportunity to lead, to serve, and also to contribute back to the country was an opportunity that I took uh, and I never regret it since. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. I see. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Some people choose fields of study like for example political science or for example economics right with the intention maybe of well going into administration maybe not just of businesses but perhaps um you know of the government as well do you feel that maybe yeah. your education in some way prepared you for your political career you did mention that well going into politics and deciding eventually to do that was something that was kind of inculcated in you from a very young age, right, you say? That's right. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I mean, as much as much as my surrounding mm -hmm. uh, uh, was that of uh, uh, prepared me somewhat you know, mm -hmm. to, be, uh, to be a politician. Uh, I remember having many guests who were politicians coming to my house, uh, staying overnight, mm -hmm. uh, having seen people having political discussions. But that, having said that, doesn't really prepare me to be in politics, uh, uh, in, uh, as having a career in politics. It just makes me understand, you know, what 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 a politician's life is all about, you know, so mm -hmm. to speak. But uh, I did take up political science, apart from economics, and but I I felt that uh, political science just gave me the framework, you know, mm -hmm. uh, understanding of what politics is, what's a different types of democracies, different type of ways of forming government, etc. But that doesn't prepare me for real politics. Mm -hmm. And when I say real politics, it's politics on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the situations when you meet people, uh, dealing with people, uh, understanding people. And, uh, and that is very unique to the constituency that one actually represents. Mm -hmm. Those kind of experiences are not actually taught in school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, they're not taught in school. It mm -hmm. also involves understanding people's behaviors, you know, mm -hmm. and also cultures as well. Mm -hmm. Cultures, languages, nuances 
of different communities, you know. Mm -hmm. Even within the same community, you have different approach mm -hmm. and different attitudes of people, you know, mm -hmm. living from one village to, to the next. Mm -hmm. So I think all this was actually, uh, I learned along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very fortunate to have the to opportunity. People gave me a chance. And of course, along the way, I faced many, many challenges. Mm -hmm. But uh, at least I had a good start. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, education generally does help a lot you know, in giving you the access uh, to office. As you mentioned yourself, looking at those universities, you know, uh, you call me a Calibank, you know, which is not true. Mm -hmm. But it well, does well, give well. me give <laughs> the impression, <laughs> feel the impression that, yeah, you know, this guy, you know, this guy has studied uh, in some mm -hmm. of the best schools and having done that, you know, people give you a second chance, you know, or, or not a second chance, but give you a chance, you know, mm -hmm. get yourself a seat on the table, so to speak. Amazing. But everything else really is something that you learn along the way. And I think uh, so far I had a, a great, a great uh, pathway you know, uh, in politics mm -hmm. at an early age. So I see. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I found quite difficult about interviewing you the very first time was that, well, there was this whole element really of these kinds of experiences that you had had um, when you were younger. And so this time around, I will change um, the questioning approach and ask, of all of the experiences that you had while you were a child, what do you feel were most formative to you in your political life and why do you feel that way? I think the experiences of having to, to meet politicians, you know, members of parliament, mm -hmm. uh, when I was still in the school, having to have conversations with them when they were at my house, <laughs> at my house, whether they are staying in my house or us going fishing, mm -hmm. uh, because my house happened to have a river at the back, and we always have this kind of gathering sessions, you know? mm -hmm. gathering sessions where we eat together, having the opportunity to actually speak to them about them, you know? mm -hmm. about what they do, and, uh, and just having to know their opinion. I think that gave me the initial opening mm -hmm. into seeing how the life of a politician is. Mm -hmm. Apart from my father, who is also a politician, but to actually understand the culture, the Daya culture, the Iban culture in particular, mm -hmm. and what that entails in terms of being an elected representative in those kind of environments, you know. So mm -hmm. I think that, that that's probably my first most uh, eye-opening experience, yeah. Wonderful. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that. And so I would now ask from the standpoint of a, well, regular citizen, um, not elected representative, mm -hmm. But I want to hear your take. How do you feel that the life of somebody who is involved in politics is different from, let's say, somebody who is not involved in politics? Yeah, they're talking about a professional in Malaysia. Yeah, it's a nine to five job, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're talking about a person who is an entrepreneur, uh, their, their time is a bit more flexible. Mm -hmm. If you are a politician, your time is very flexible, and at the same time, that your time is not really your time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean to say that people can actually call you up any time of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, people can go into your house, meet you, uh, irregardless of who 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 they are. Yeah, you, Wait, really? yeah, yeah. You meet you meet, you meet a lot of, a lot of people. You know, everyone owns your time, uh, uh, owns your attention uh -huh. uh, because you service, you represent them. Ah, uh, I see. And I think a good politicians should be a uh, someone who actually sacrifices time, their attention. And also, even to some extent, their resources, you know, mm. uh, to give back to the community. Mm. And I think that's probably the most, uh, the biggest uh, distinguishing factor uh, mm. between a person who is in politics and who's not in politics. And of course, in politics, you have to deal with uh, not just national issues, state issues, but also individual issues, mm. uh, community issues, and also having to balance out different interest groups mm -hmm. because it's not just about the community that you represent, uh, one particular race. You also have to consider the feelings of other races, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you're a national politician, then you have to consider the feelings of different states as well. Mm -hmm. So I think there are many factors in decision making for a politician. Mm -hmm. And for a person who is not in politics, uh, those are considerations that you don't really have to look into. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people who are not in politics, they are also a bit more forthright you know, mm -hmm. in their opinions. Uh, perhaps a little more critical. Mm -hmm. And for politicians, sometimes you have to mellow out the sensitivities mm. uh, in order to appease uh, the general populace. 
Mm. And also to look into what is the general well-being, you know, how your message is going to impact the country that you actually serve. So politicians have different angles to actually consider when uh, making statements or, or even in their actions. Mm. Yeah. Wow, it sounds like there's a lot of like weight on the shoulders right there. You just have to be more empathetic, you know, mm -hmm. to people's situations. You know? I won't phrase it as the way you did, say weight on the shoulders, I don't think it's a burden. Mm. But I think you just have to be more considerate. You must have the sort of peripheral view, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not just uh, what's in front, what's ahead of you, but also what's on the side, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what your actions will impact others, you know, how it impacts others. Mm -hmm. So I think these are the considerations for politicians to take. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Speaking, for example, as a citizen, right? The uh Internet, of course, is a divided place. You have people typing out like comments, like keyboard warriors, like left, right, front and center. And when we think about, for example, politics in this country that pander uh, sometimes to very specific racial groups or interest groups right there. So that is a common uh, thing that we do see. When you speak of empathy, would you say that, well, your view is something that is shared maybe like by a lot of politicians throughout Malaysia as well? Necessary. I think my view is my view. Mm -hmm. I think different uh, parties also have different interests, mm -hmm. uh, interest groups, communities they represent. Some parties in Malaysia are race-based. Mm -hmm. Some parties in Malaysia are also based on religion as well. In any political organization, there are always people who are moderates and also those who are on the extreme. Mm -hmm. So uh, depending on the political situation of the day, parties may take different stand. Mm -hmm. it also depends on the leaders as well. Mm -hmm. I won't say that my view is the general view, mm -hmm. but I think there are a lot of people who are more moderate you know, in this mm -hmm. country. You know? Although sometimes we see comments on the social media or in the news where a particular leader expresses a very extreme view. Mm -hmm. But if there wasn't such a, a leader express, expressing that kind of view, you wouldn't get into the papers, you know. Mm. Uh, you won't get into the media. I see. So we have to take everything by a pinch of salt, you know, and also mm -hmm. understand that there is a certain perception you know, uh, played out mm -hmm. on certain parties to make them look more extreme than they are. And of course, if that kind of uh, extremism is not being curtailed or addressed, mm -hmm. then that becomes a general rule of thumb. You know? uh, people take it as that is the view of the whole party. So I think in Malaysia, especially being a multiracial society that we are in, it's very important for us to, to balance things out. Uh, and also, I would say that those who are today uh, in government was once upon a time opposition members, you know, mm -hmm. and those who are in the opposition were once upon a time government members. And having the opportunity to, to be uh, in service together with them, you know, throughout the last seven years, I have a feeling that opposition is not as bad as they sound. And sometimes in government, we are also having to compromise on some of the principles that we were elected on. Mm -hmm. So politics slowly but surely is also moving slightly more to the center. Mm -hmm. I think the opposition, when they come to government, they also have to be more centrist mm -hmm. in order to consolidate the whole country. Mm -hmm. And so I think politics in Malaysia, if we were able to find balance you know, in this, uh, hopefully the country will still maintain its cause of growing our economy and also uh, maintaining this sort of peaceful uh, harmonious situation that we have. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So if I could ask then, since this is technically a podcast about education, I'm wondering, so you may not have had, well, your time at LSE or Columbia Business School, well, directly influenced your time in politics, but would you say that it has played a role really in like shaping the kinds of decisions that you've uh, been making? Well, definitely has uh, helped me in terms of critical thinking, mm -hmm. uh, helped me in broaden my knowledge, uh, experience, you know, um, and also approach you know, yeah, somewhat. Yeah? And of course, in, in uh, university, it's not just about the, the books, you know, and, and the courses that you study, but also the people you meet. Mm -hmm. And having to have that kind of uh, intellectual conversation with, with those who are, are people of different fields and and having to, to look at things differently, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not everyone thinks like a Malaysian, for instance, you know? If you're mm -hmm. sent in the UK, you, you interact mm -hmm. with the British. And of course, there's so many people who are from different ethnicities coming to study there, or even in, U in the US for that matter, you know? 
So I think it actually broadens your view of the world. And I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Wonderful. And then flipping that on its head for a quick bit, how do you feel that your time in politics so far has influenced the way that you have educated yourself over the course of time? I mean, to be in politics, to serve the constituency that I represent, which is mainly a rural constituency, a diet-based constituency, that has actually made me understand better uh, the community that I represent, and also to understand why people in rural constituencies make decisions that they do. Mm. And that has also shaped how I make my decisions mm -hmm. because I represent them. Right. So end of the day, it's important that uh, you understand people's needs mm -hmm. and you are able to address them. Mm -hmm. And that is something that would not be easily understood mm -hmm. by someone who lives in the urban area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is something very uh, unique uh, mm -hmm. for my case. In this particular case, of course, it's not through through universities or schools, but actually learning through my interaction with people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you also get to understand that uh, people in rural areas, of course, they are very simple, more straightforward, more direct. Mm -hmm. You can also see more sincerity as well. Mm -hmm. and how they uh, how they reciprocate uh, uh, your efforts you know mm -hmm. and in serving in serving them mm -hmm. um, and essentially at the end of the day it's also how because of due to limited resources um, you're not able to appease everyone you know? mm -hmm. and how you're able to say no and let them feel good about it mm -hmm. so I think as a politician that's the most important skill uh, one needs to develop you know? mm -hmm. How do you actually explain to people that is acceptable to them? Mm -hmm. And how are you able to address those issues? Not if you can't address them now, but later in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful, cool. So thank you for that. I remember that in our last conversation, mm -hmm. you were saying that, in fact, a lot of what politicians do that seems to not make sense um, to the general public, like actually in some sense, kind of like satisfies their constituents. Well, we have, we have to refer to They have an appeal yes. to the people who elected them. Right. And we have to understand that in that context. Ah. So, 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 you so in that context. So why is it that some people you, you feel that, no, look, they are just plain idiots, you know. <laughs> why are they elected time and time again, you know? And to politics, you know? Yeah. Well, if you look at how to perform the constituency, wow, you'll be amazing. You know? Wow. They deliver. They deliver. They help the people. They help the poor. Okay, they get things done. I found that such a fascinating idea. I think that you cited the example of like Bung Mokta Radin, for example, um, the last time. Yeah. I think it's important to understand who is the message uh, crafted for. Mm -hmm. So a politician can make a statement and the question that one needs to ask is who is that statement addressed to? Mm -hmm. uh, even though you read it in the papers, it may be addressed to other politicians. Mm -hmm. It may be addressed to the people. Mm -hmm. And so I think there, at times, you might see certain inconsistencies, you know, mm -hmm. in, uh, in the messaging. Mm -hmm. But believe me, I think politicians, when they make statements, they actually address it. They know exactly who they're addressing it to. Mm -hmm. And the uh, intended party also mm -hmm. understands and also picks it up. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, how do you feel that it has been for you to represent the Julao constituency's interests in parliament and on the national level? Because before this, you were not in parliament, right? Like, you were essentially the baby of the house, as I recall, in the state uh, at that time right there. So... How has that experience been for you, representing the interests of your constituency on a national level? Mm. I mean, for as you mentioned, baby of the house, that's a long time ago. <laughs> I'm not so much of a baby anymore. That's when I was like, Forever, uh, yeah. like 20, Forever, 20, yeah. 22 years old. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that was the time when I represented the sea called Pelagos mm -hmm. uh, for 10, 10 good years. Uh, that was also my hometown as well, of yeah. Kapit, you know. And many years later, I, I stood in Julao yeah. in 2018 and got re-elected in 2022. Representing Julao 
has been a very interesting experience. Mm -hmm. uh, partly because Jilao, when I took over in 2018, it was it had actually the poorest district in Malaysia. Wow, the yeah, poorest the district poorest, in Malaysia. Uh, the poorest. Jilao was was actually acknowledged as the poorest in Parliament by the then uh, Minister Rina Harun. Yeah? She was the Minister of Rural Development. Mm -hmm. And uh, she actually mentioned that Jilao was actually the poorest district. And for me to actually serve a poor, a very poor district, and to actually bring them out of that poverty, you know, mm -hmm. to some to some extent, building more infrastructure, helping out the social welfare of the people, mm -hmm. and also growing and expanding the commodities that they have in the region, I think does help, does help people elevate them from poverty. Mm -hmm. So for me, I feel that as a very rewarding experience mm -hmm. for me per se, and also Jula had many. Uh, we had no petrol station, uh, and our st and really? our, yeah, and the, and the constituency is the size of Malacca, wow. and, this, and also Wilaya combined, you know. <laughs> so people had to travel very far away just to fill up their petrol. There was no fire station. Many areas in the constituency did not have Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, it was maybe twenty thirty percent only. Wow, it's like the you're not mostly been type situation. It's a situation where you're in the jungle and you can't reach out people. You have no line, uh, phone signal, you have no Wi-Fi. What if you climb a tree? Like, would you be able to get Wi-Fi then? Uh, maybe it depends on which tree you climb. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, so the sort of complexities, challenges, uh, lacking of roads, lacking of clean water supply, yep. uh, and uh, electricity. You know, that, I mean, many of the areas were not connected. I have over 30 schools mm -hmm. in my constituency, and over 20 of them were next to the road, but they were not connected to the power, power supply. So they always had to rely on generator sets. And in the, in the, in cases of, of of those schools, I mean, there was even one that actually got burned down you know, because of the power voltage, uh, the inconsistency in power voltage. So I mean, wow. we have many many challenges that we face in Julau that people would not understand in in urban areas like KL. But having said that, we have addressed those issues. Today we already have a petrol station in a place called Antabai and we have a few more that's actually coming up pending approval from the state government mm -hmm. in terms of the land authority. We have also got a planning for the fire station in Julau. We have also have an increase in internet connectivity in the area mm -hmm. about 70-80%. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a huge improvement. Road connectivity, water connectivity uh, is also in the process and it's also been increased uh, dramatically. Previously uh, there was only one ATM machine in the whole of Jilao, and today we have three. Wow. So people's lives are improving, and that is something that's very rewarding for me as a, as a local MP. Those issues may not seem like very big issues if you're living in KL, mm -hmm. but believe me, if you, are, if you are someone in the category of being labeled as B40, mm -hmm. which is poor, poor, and also, uh, uh, also not being able to access these facilities, I think it greatly disadvantages them mm. uh, in their daily uh, day to day business. You know? So having those facilities uh, and utilities installed, it does elevate the poverty and also improve people's lives. Mm. I've also been able to uh, assist them directly in uh, their education, you know? mm. uh, giving out education grants, you know, uh, yes. to to students. The Larry Sung Education Larry Sung Fund. Education Fund, and up, up to today, I would say that. Uh, more than a thousand students in Jilao mm -hmm. have actually benefited from it. Mm -hmm. So I think that is something that, uh, that I'm very proud of. And I think that has actually benefited people there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I'd like to move into a broader question about the role of education. From a human capital standpoint, education can be thought of as the, shall we say, golden key for a person maybe to move up the socioeconomic ladder. It can be thought of as a way for somebody to transform their lives right there in a whole bunch of different ways. But I'd like to hear your take on it um, from the perspective of an MP who is currently in Parliament. Why is education important for the people of Malaysia and what is it that you think that a good education should be? Okay. I think 20 years ago, uh, when I represented a state constituency called Pelagos, 
if we were to visit a longhouse, what is the longhouse? I have to explain here is uh, it's actually a very a longhouse, an elongated house with maybe about 10, 20, 30 or 40 families you know, mm. living under one roof. And in most of those cases, you, I mean, you have a long house, maybe the population is 200, 300 people. You'd be surprised to even find a graduate mm. in a long house or even, or, or just say in one family, for instance, or even you'd be surprised to find two or three graduates in one long house. That's 20, 30 years ago, 20, 20 years ago. And today, I would say that almost every family has a family member who is actually studying a diploma or a degree program. Mm. So I can say with much confidence that definitely education has been uh, a very big contributing factor for uh, rural, the rural constituencies I represent. Mm. And, uh, and also in terms of the level of academic distinction uh, one requires in order to get into service, for instance, in the government. If we are looking at the time of independence, you know, you may have a district officer who has just only achieved primary three uh, level of education. Mm. And today, most of them are actually degree holders, you know, mm. minimum, you know. And even for longhouse villages, the village chief, uh, many of the new village chiefs are being degree holders. Mm. Uh, and previously, they were not educated, you know, mm. uh, not, not having really very high formal education. So. So definitely education plays a very big important role in shaping the administration uh, that we see in the constituency. Uh, it also shapes the sort of entrepreneurs that are coming out, well, degree holders or you know, uh, diploma holders, uh, having to do uh, uh, farming, mm -hmm. for instance, and uh, actually doing business. You know? uh, we can see more and more of that today, which was very, very rare uh, in the past. Of course, in terms of the downside that we also encounter in rural constituencies is that due to the lack of job opportunities, you know, mm. you may find graduates who are end up ending up working in supermarkets, you know, and mm. cashier points. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's only because of maybe a mismatch in terms of what they study and also what they uh, uh, mm. the, the jobs they take. Mm. But I would say that slowly and slowly, I think the government and also the business community as a whole. We'll come together to address this. Mm. Thank you for that. And the problem that you pointed out, right, is definitely something that's been on the news as well, like news of PhD holders, for example, serving as grab drivers or like food delivery people along the way right there. And also there's this tale, um, unfortunate as it is, of rain drain people going overseas and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So when you look towards the future, I mean, I've seen a lot of stories about how recently in Malaysia, we've had a recrudescence, you know, like lots of good news coming out, upgraded by JP Morgan, national semiconductor strategy, investments all around flush coming into Malaysia, um, partly because of the NSS and a range of other things along the way. As you kind of look towards the future then, what kinds of things can we expect um, from our country's business community, government or upper level administration in creating an environment where more educated people can thrive in this country. What do you see in time will be, I guess, the government's play to make Malaysia a place more attractive to graduates and become more, shall we say, capable of absorbing like high quality talents into Malaysia as a whole? For many years, we are stuck in the middle income trap, whereby government is not attracting the sort of business uh, that they ideally would like to, that gives high paying jobs. You know? And also, in order to do that, the country needs to have uh, be more selective you know, in terms of what type of investments they bring in. And I believe that this government is actually doing that. I've been to Taiwan recently. Mm. I met some of the uh, semiconductor companies, mm. and they are also looking at investing in Malaysia. Mm. Um, there's one particular one, uh, Faison, uh, which is also uh, started by Malaysian. Mm. They're going to start thing, right? Yeah, and they're gonna they're gonna have a company here in Malaysia, and they're gonna employ Malaysians, you know, to work in their, in their business. And I believe their opening salary is like six thousand for engineers, you know, mm. which is much higher than what engineers are actually earning. In Malaysia at this moment. Mm. Uh, I think the opening salary at this moment is only about 3,000 
and for those who have master's degrees, it's only like three thousand five or something. So I think it's it's, mm. it's, 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 it's very low. Uh, the ROI takes a long time, you know. Mm. And because of that, we are losing talent you know, to nearby countries that has a stronger currency that uh, gives a more attractive pay, you know. Mm. Uh, and I think in order for us to to catch up, we need to get the right companies coming in, mm. the right industries. Mm so that they can actually provide opportunities to Malaysians to fill those roles, you know? Mm. Yeah, so that, that's generally my take. That's the only way we can actually uh, get out of the middle income trap. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And a last question um, for you on this front then. If you could revolutionize Malaysia's education system in one way from where you are right now, then how might you choose to do it? I would say that it's important for the Ministry of Education to actually give a little bit of leeway mm -hmm. in terms of the curriculum, in terms of the way education is being uh, taught in schools to the individual states. Uh, I believe if you look at Sarawak, for instance, we place a very strong emphasis on uh, English, mm. uh, English and also science as well, STEM subjects, you know. And because of that, there are also many more international schools. That being uh, that being built of recent years because education is still a federal responsibility, mm -hmm. so they actually take charge on the curriculum that's being taught in school. And Sarawak, for instance, feels that education in English, educating our people in English, is important. And because we are not able to change that, therefore, more international schools are being built to address that issue. And I feel that, of course, the whole country uh, there are many different groups, you know different groups and different states may have different emphasis. If we are able to allow each and every state in this country to have a little bit more say mm -hmm. in how they would like education to be taught in those states, I believe, I believe that it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that will perhaps address some of the issues, bring up our students to be more adaptive of, of the work environment mm -hmm. uh, and also to maybe address some of the needs that those states have that other states don't, you know. Mm. So I believe personally, I think we need to relax our education system. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And also, not only that, um, I believe TVET is a very important aspect of education. We're looking at higher education. I mean, it's not always about universities. And I believe also that our universities, in terms of courses, we need to uh, address this because there are also some courses which are quite redundant, you know. I've heard many stories of uh, of students going to take up courses simply because there's only vacancies in those courses, you know. Mm. And as a result, after having graduated, they can't find the jobs. If we can actually address those kind of issues, the mismatch that we have in our society, be a bit more strict, you know, on what kind of courses are being taught and also what universities or institutions mm. uh, should be in the market, then I think we can actually provide a better education formulations as a whole. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And now, moving away from just education, um, on to your constituency, Julau, and to Sarawak as a whole. Kind of moving forward, looking forward into the future, um, I'm sure that you have many years of politics uh, ahead of you right here, but you'd be re-elected right there. <laughs> Pray. But, what kind of Example or role do you hope that your constituency of Julau and also Sarawak in general will play in the history of Malaysia going forward? Well, I think Julau uh, is an important contributor to the country in the sense that we are a major producer of uh, pepper, for instance. Pepper, mm -hmm. you know, the pepper that we have on the state. Black pepper. And yeah, sour pepper. pepper. Sour pepper, yeah. Wow. Most of it is actually grown in Jilao. Wow. Yeah, so that's important, yeah. You that's do a great pepper. service to, <laughs> to, <world. laughs> to the world. I think it's the best quality pepper in the world. Oh, yeah, see, yeah. wow. And we do command a premium, you know, especially when we export to Japan, you know, and also to China and Taiwan. In addition to that, it can also be a great place to actually produce other commodities as well, simply because of the land size. It's so huge, you know given that this country is actually a net importer of food, you know, like rice and also fruits, etc. Perhaps 
places like Jilao and, and also other parts of Sarawak. So those kind of constituencies can actually be the food basket for this region. Mm. Not just Malaysia, but maybe perhaps the region. Mm. Yeah, so that's something I'm very hopeful. And given that now that we have the capital of Indonesia, that's just right outside our borders, and Kalimantan, and Nus they call it Nusantara, that's also very close proximity to Sarawak. And due to that, there is also going to be many, many economic spin-offs uh, from there. And I believe that both uh, countries can actually benefit on the island of Borneo. In addition to that, Jila has a big role to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wonderful. Mm. And Sarawak in general, like, well, it's been years since we've had the Malaysian Agreement, uh, 63 right here. Yeah. And Sarawak is increasingly known as a leader in education, for example. You have, well, leadership green energy. in having green energy, part of the NETR, if I'm not wrong, National Energy Transition Roadmap. You guys are knocking it out of the park. Wow. Yeah, it's good. It's good. So, thinking about this uh, amazing, awesome, hip, cool state that you're a part of right here. So, yeah, like, what you hope will be its role in the history of Malaysia going forward? I hope uh, that Sarawak is able to get more autonomy mm -hmm. moving forward, you know? They have already achieved a good level of autonomy mm -hmm. from the federal government, but I think there's more to be done. You know? Given our approach to issues, uh, especially like local issues like race, and religion, uh, we don't have the sort of hiccups that we have in West Malaysia mm -hmm. or other parts of the country. You know? And because of that, we're able to focus more on development mm -hmm. and our economy mm -hmm. and also try to uh, to bring up our state to do more business with neighboring countries as well, uh, like Singapore and also Indonesia. And of course, Brunei. Brunei is just, just next door. So I believe that Sarawak, in terms of its economy, we're able to catch up. Uh, and also not just catch up, but even maybe perhaps overtake even slang oil you know, in the near future. Mm -hmm. Our Premier has actually mentioned that you know, mm -hmm. as one of uh, the possibilities that we can actually see in the near future. And, uh, and I believe that moving on, looking at the numbers, we mm -hmm. can achieve that. Yes. Yeah. So like all my three basar sweating right now. <laughs> in the, no, no. My good friend. <laughs> <laughs> friendly competition, friendly competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone wants to, to develop their own state. You know? Yeah, that's true. And I think that uh, Sarawak is heading in the direction, right direction. Mm, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Wadi Larissa. It's been an amazing yeah, uh, interview. Thank you, you so much. And yeah, so like, it's an honor. And I hope that your ambitions, uh, political career, and all good things will come to your constituency of Julao. Uh, so and thank you for representing us in Malaysian Parliament from a Malaysian citizen is an honor. Thank, thank you, you again. Thanks. Thank you so much. And all the best to you as well. Thank you so much. Yeah,